The next item of business is a statement by Ivan McKee on Scotland's Vision for Trade annual report. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interruptions or interventions. And I call on Ivan McKee. Up to 10 minutes, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, Scotland is a proud trading nation. For centuries, we have exported goods and services across the globe. Today, we are food and drink, higher education, science, technology exports, to name but a few, are renowned the world over. In Scotland, we recognise that international trade is a force for good but it can also present us with difficult challenges, from how we respond to world events out with our control to how we ensure the benefits of trade are shared equitably and responsibly. In recent years, the complex system of international trading connections has come under considerable strain. The COVID-19 pandemic presented unprecedented challenges to the supply of critical products. The UK's hard exit from the EU compounded these challenges, creating barriers to our access to the goods and services we take for granted and to our ability to share what we produce with our neighbours. In January 2021, amid this disruption and uncertainty, I presented Scotland's vision for trade to this Parliament. The vision offers a longer-term perspective and coherent approach to trade, a set of guiding principles we can use to underpin our trade decisions and relationships. Today, I am pleased to present the first annual report detailing our progress so far in implementing the vision. The context in which I am doing so is, of course, marked by further dramatic shifts in the global trading system. The need to apply principles to international trade decisions has become even more important. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has brought a new global crisis and humanitarian catastrophe. Trade and economic relationships with Russia have been a particular focus of the coordinated worldwide response. The vision provides our guiding principles as we stand in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. The report I present to you today documents how we have been putting those core principles of inclusive growth, well-being, sustainability, net zero and good governance into practice to meet the needs of Scotland's people and businesses. It sets out the actions we have taken to implement our vision, our progress in using the levers available to the Scottish Government, how we have sought to influence the UK Government in those areas where levers are currently reserved. As I said last year when laying out our vision before Parliament, actions speak louder than words. I want, therefore, to take a few moments to highlight a few of the actions we have taken so far. Last year, of course, Glasgow hosted one of the most important gatherings of world leaders this century. Scotland can, of course, be proud of COP26 for many reasons. One of those reasons, however, is that it marked the end of our overseas support and promotion activities solely focused on fossil fuel goods and services, a commitment we made in the Vision for Trade. Looking ahead, we are turning our focus to supporting the energy and climate transition, using momentum from COP26 to deliver real opportunities for Scotland. For example, creating opportunities is a core part of our hydrogen action plan, which will help make Scotland a leading nation in the production of reliable, competitive and sustainable hydrogen. We have also focused in this first year on improving the trading environment for Scotland's businesses. Our businesses can face a number of barriers to trading internationally, Something as simple as product labelling requirements can deter companies from entering a market or increase costs. Addressing such market barriers can open up significant opportunities for businesses. We have therefore developed a methodology to identify and prioritise the most significant market access barriers affecting Scottish trade so we can begin addressing them. In taking advantage of trade opportunities, we have consistently sought to strike the right balance between competing priorities to ensure that trade rules do not jeopardise other important aims. The vision provides us with a framework for doing so. For example, our Greenport proposals adapt the UK's Freeport model to help deliver a net zero economy and a fair work first approach. And our notification to the WTO of our single use plastics regulations allowed us to demonstrate transparency and openness to the scrutiny that comes with effective global governance while ensuring that trade rules do not prevent Scotland from meeting ambitious environmental targets. However, as the report makes clear, there is much more we can do to advance Scotland's economic, social and environmental aims through trade. We are at the beginning of implementing our vision and are open, honest and ambitious about the work ahead of us. These actions will not be taken in isolation from other strategies, but will underpin and support them by helping to create optimal trading conditions for Scotland's businesses. 
For example, the vision will directly support the National Strategy for Economic Transformation's aims to strengthen Scotland's position in new markets and industries, alongside generating new well-paid jobs from a just transition to net zero and supporting Scotland's export growth plan, a trading nation. For our economy, this includes identifying further opportunities to make it easier for Scottish businesses to trade digitally, while boosting our international recognition as an ethical digital nation, objectives shared by the recently published technology sector export plan. For Scotland's people, recognising that there are winners and losers from trade, we will build our evidence base on what those differential impacts are and how we can address them. That approach aligns with our ambitions for our economy to drive progress towards a fairer and more equal society as set out in our national strategy for economic transformation. For the planet, we will continue to build coherence between our climate, environmental and trade ambitions, developing our understanding of the strengths and opportunities presented by our environmental goods and service sectors. While we are clear about actions that Scotland can and should take in relation to trade, we are also reliant on others to act in a way that supports our economy, people and the planet. As the report details for trade-related levers sit with Westminster, we have pressed the UK Government to use them to support Scotland. For example, since leaving the EU, against Scotland's wishes, the UK Government has pursued a series of ad hoc free trade agreements with countries around the world. While presented as a benefit of Brexit, in reality, the expected economic benefits from these deals is tiny, in no way compensating for the economic impact of EU exit. Given the impact of these agreements across a wide range of devolved and reserved issues, we and the other devolved nations have repeatedly called for a full role for the devolved administrations and legislators in all trade negotiations. Despite the UK Government's refusal, we have engaged fully on each and every agreement, pressing for greater opportunities for Scotland's strong services sectors and the reduction of tariff and non-tariff barriers for our priority goods exports. In doing so, we have drawn on the principle set in the vision to promote and protect Scottish trade priorities. Our call for increased involvement is not just about process. The UK Government has recently signed FTAs with Australia and New Zealand. Both of these raised issues of profound importance to Scotland, where our lack of a formal role so our concerns ignored. We have consistently pressed the UK Government to protect Scottish producers from imports originating from countries with different environmental and animal welfare standards. Appropriate protection was not included in either agreement. Now, for example, a Scottish premium beef exporter risks being undercut by competitors from Australia and New Zealand who are not competing on a level playing field of like-for-like -like standards. We also continue to press the UK Government in other areas. As our nearest and largest trading partner, we continue to push for the UK Government to build on the terms of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement and deepen the, EU's, uh, the UK's relationship with the EU. And we are engaging with the UK Government to ensure that Scottish interests are identified, protected and promoted at the WTO, reflecting commitments made in the vision. Signing off, in the Vision for Trade, we issued an open invitation to individuals, businesses and other organisations in Scotland and globally to discuss trade policy with us. I want to reiterate that call for engagement. Those inputs are crucial to our work, implementing the vision, ensuring our approach is informed by their experience and expertise. Last year, I told Parliament that this vision made clear the kind of country we want to be, with strong principles to guide how we do business around the world, so that people, companies and other governments know who we are and what we represent as a nation. One year on, this report demonstrates that we remain absolutely committed to openly, transparently and unapologetically setting high standards for ourselves and for others. Sign officer, I began this statement by reflecting on Scotland's proud trading legacy in a context of turbulent global affairs and strains on the international trading system, unprecedented in modern times. Scotland does not forget its principles, nor compromise them when it suits. Today, we continue that legacy. Thank you. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to ask a question can press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for early sight. In the first paragraph in his statement, he quite rightly mentions that the higher education sector is one of the key sectors uh, when it comes to improving 
uh, a, a whole range of economic uh, factors, and he's absolutely right in that. The University of Scotland, however, have commented that Scotland isn't sufficiently competitive when it comes to economic growth, and that was one of the unanimous conclusions of the Finance Committee in this Parliament. So can I just read to him uh, a short section of the University of Scotland's uh, comment on this, that the Research Excellent Grant has declined in real terms by 18.2 per cent since financial year 2014-15. And in the same period, Scotland's universities have won a progressively smaller percentage share of the UK RI resources, down from 15.4% to 12.9%. Could I ask the Minister what he thinks the reason is for Scotland not winning so many of these uh, research grant projects and what is being done to address that? And secondly, uh, the Minister also refers to improving the trade environment for Scotland's businesses. And he will know that one of the big asks of the business community and indeed the funding council is that much more has to be done to both upskill and reskill our workforce with much more focus on digital skills, data science and leadership and management skills with far more resources being available through the National Transition Training Fund. So can I ask the Minister if that's going to happen? Minister. Uh, I thank the member for the question. First, on terms of um, economic growth, um, as we emerge from COVID, we are determined to continue to grow Scotland's economy. The biggest drain, of course, on our, uh, on our economic growth is, of course, the policies of uh, the, the, the UK Westminster Government in taking Scotland out of um, uh, out of Europe against their will, and that, that's been the biggest impact on, on growth and international trade and investment opportunities for Scotland. It's absolutely right about the, the, the world-leading position of Scotland's universities. I'm, I'm just back from Expo in Dubai. Uh, Harriet Watt University are the biggest, the biggest international uh, university in, in the Emirates, a position that we in there are very proud of. I met with them in their new campus uh, and also with Strathclyde University uh, in their campus uh, in Dubai. And Scotland's universities are presented extremely well um, and, and very leading positions right around the world, something we continue to work with the university sector to promote and develop, recognising an absolute cornerstone, not just in academic excellence, um, promoting our values, but in promoting trade and investment opportunities uh, around the world. Uh, if we talk about uh, research and development spend, Scotland continues to uh, lead Europe in terms of our higher education R&D spend, something we're rightly proud of and continue to focus relentlessly on. Um, as the member identified herself, Scotland uh, gains 13 per cent of, uh, of UK spend on uh, R&D, far above our population share of uh, where we are now. And we continue to work in that hugely competitive environment to make sure that Scotland uh, punches above our weight. And turning to the issue of digital skills, the member, and I'm sure she has, has read our uh, inward investment plan, Shaping Scotland's Economy, that identifies a key action increasing the number of digitally uh, trained uh, individuals within, uh, the, focused on digital careers within Scotland from 4,000 a year to 10,000 a year, and we're on target to, uh, to achieve those uh, numbers. And across the wider upskilling uh, piece across the whole economy, we should be well aware of the significant funding the Scottish Government is putting into uh, digital uh, upskilling and reskilling right across a whole range of uh, skills that are required for uh, Scotland's uh, maintaining its leading position in the, the key industries of the future. Daniel Johnson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for a prior sight of his statement? And I think he's absolutely right to emphasise the importance of trade. Trade is fundamentally important if we want to see improved prosperity uh, and, most importantly, an uh, increased number of high-quality jobs, particularly as we look to transition away from oil, which has been for a number of decades at the top of Scotland's export table. However, in order to make a difference, you need targets, metrics and milestones. And I have to say, I think this update and the report that it, it, it uh, updates on is rather light on numbers, which is surprised because I think the 2019 A Trading Nation report did an excellent job of identifying metrics. So my first question is, will the government in future updates to this plan commit to a range of metrics so that we can actually measure progress? Looking at some of the metrics from a trading nation, it uh, pointed out that 0.2% of Scotland's GDP is attributable to trade and set a benchmark of 0.5%. Also identified a number of opportunity gaps with key markets, particularly the USA, which was a 10.7% gap. So are there any updates on those core benchmark metrics for our trade? Likewise, uh, it identified that 97,000 
uh, uh, firms do not export in Scotland, and 10,500 export just 18% uh, of their output. Are there any update on those numbers? Indeed, is there any update on the number of firms that the Scottish Government has assisted in the last year? But the real question is this. We need to ask ourselves, what does Scotland want to sell to the world? world? And for this report and its future updates to be helpful, we need metrics. So please, can we have them? Minister. Uh, I, I'm delighted to be able to um, uh, re respond to the member's uh, question by making him aware that we will very shortly uh, be bringing forward an update on a trading nation and providing exactly the data that he requires, and that's in the final stages. have been pulled together now some two and a half years uh, after we published the, uh, the plan. We'll also be bringing forward uh, very shortly an update on our FDI plan, shaping Scotland's economy, to um, articulate the progress we've made there. And, and rest assured, a full suite of numbers will be available as part of those, uh, those updates. Remember, we need to recognise that uh, what we're talking about here today is the, the Vision for Trade, which is one of the four uh, international plans that we have uh, alongside a trading nation, which focuses on uh, what we sell and how, how, how we sell that around the world. It supports businesses to sell more. Uh, our inward investment plan, which um, uh, focuses on how we continue to cement Scotland's position as the leading um, inward investment attraction across the UK outside of London. And, of course, our global capital investment plan, which related very much to the natural capital investment works that my uh, colleague, uh, Mary McAllen, has taken forward in our previous statement. The vision for trade is about our principles. It's about the measures we take to make sure um, that those those principles that are applied to how we trade. It's about how we trade rather than, than what we trade. And those other plans in that suite uh, of work are, uh, are where we focus on, on the numbers, which uh, he knows uh, that I am hugely focused on. So this is about our principles. It's about the concrete actions we're taking to embed, develop those principles to ensure good governance around trade uh, and to work with others to uh, take forward environmental, social and other standards and make sure that we tackle those aspects of our trading relationship. Willie Coffey to be followed by Jamie Halper Johnston. Thank you, President Officer. As the Minister said, there is no trade deal that the UK Government can strike that will make up for what Brexit has taken away from Scotland. And it's clear that the UK Government is not delivering on our trade vision, but instead is bargaining away Scottish interests. Does the Minister agree with me that with the full powers of independence, Scotland would be able to put our own objectives and values? Part of our trade decisions and relationships in the future. Minister. Uh, governments around the world have um, a range of levers available to them to influence trade and its impact. And today's report outlines we have uh, the progress we have made using the levers available to us and based on our principles. It also sets out how we have uh, pressed the UK Government to use uh, those levers currently reserved to Westminster to act in the interests of Scotland, our economy, people and planet. The UK Government is negotiating a series of uh, ad hoc uh, free trade agreements, as I said, expected to result in tiny uh, increases in the economy, which in no way compensate for the loss of trade as a result of Brexit. The UK Government has no other strategy. They have not prioritised building on the terms of the current trade agreement with the EU, our nearest and largest trading partners. Our vision for trade, by contrast, is an example of a coherent uh, strategic principles-based approach to the trade that Scotland could take forward as an independent country. Jamie Halker Johnston to be followed by Fiona Hislop. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister has claimed that his is a government that seeks to reduce barriers to trade and has outward looking principles. Yet it remains his government's policies to put up hard trade barriers with our closest neighbours and our largest trading partners Absolutely. in other parts of the United Kingdom and to destroy the internal market we enjoy. So, to focus on something that he can actually deliver, can the Minister advise what this government is doing to support Scottish business, increase operations and trade opportunities within our United Kingdom market? Minister. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, the, the irony of this is remarkable. Um, it's the, uh, the Tory government, of course, that has done the most damage to, uh, to Scotland's economy and uh, our trading relationships through the completely misguided approach to, uh, to Brexit. And, and they could have done Brexit, we wouldn't have agreed with it, but they could have done it uh, in a way that maintained uh, our position in the, the, the single market and, uh, and the customs union. But of course, they, they chose to ignore that through some ridiculous points of uh, misguided principle and uh, to sacrifice uh, Scottish and UK business uh, on the altar of their, uh, 
ridiculous obsessions with uh, wanting to be uh, uh, an island apart from the rest of the world. Complete, complete nonsense. Um, the Scottish Government is focused, as is very clear in this plan, on reducing barriers to trade and continuing to do so with uh, our nearest neighbours. We work with Scottish businesses, I'm sure he's very much aware, uh, to support their ability to export internationally and to support their ability to export to the rest of the UK. We've got uh, our staff in, uh, in Scotland House in London who focus uh, on that, op opening up those opportunities for business uh, in Scotland to identify markets uh, beyond Scotland, as I say, within the rest of the UK uh, and internationally through the work that they do. So that remains the focus of, uh, of this government, reducing trade barriers, supporting Scottish business, um, increasing investment into Scotland uh, and, and continuing to deliver on that agenda. Um, and it's something we're very proud of, uh, in contrast, uh, contrast to the policies of the UK government, which has sought to destroy and erect barriers to trade at every opportunity. Thank you. Fiona Hislop to be followed by Claire Baker. Valneva's decision to develop and manufacture its COVID-19 vaccine in Scotland is very welcome, as is the recent announcement of a Scottish Enterprise funding package which will support high-quality jobs. Having one of the largest and most advanced manufacturing sites in the world in Scotland, in West Lothian, uh, comes with, brings with it substantial opportunities for exports in vaccines across the world. Can the Minister say any more about how the Scottish Government and its vision for trade will help to ensure that we realise the substantial opportunities from trade for our life sciences and biotechnology industries? Minister. Fiona Hislop is absolutely right. Scotland's uh, life science sector is a key part of Scotland's economy. I um, identified that in our national strategy for economic transformation. It's a key export sector and a trading nation and continues to uh, absolutely punch above its weight in terms of R&D and investment uh, within the sector and also uh, inward investment to the sector. Um, and we're working with the sector to, uh, through the ILG to develop a life science sector export plan, which will continue that, uh, that growth. The, um, uh, Valneva site that I had the pleasure of visiting on, uh, on Monday is remarkable for Scotland to land such a globally significant um, inward investment to manufacture at scale COVID vaccine and many other vaccines uh, here in Scotland is a real testament to the growth and strength of the sector in Scotland, not helped by the UK Government, who did their best to cut their legs away from, uh, from Valneva through the ridiculous behaviour with regard to the, the contract they had with uh, Valneva to supply vaccines. The Scottish Government stepped in, um, rescued that deal, made sure through Scottish Enterprise Investment that that, uh, that plant will, uh, will, will be one of the, the cornerstones um, I, I, of, uh, of Scotland's life science sector and one of the many um, uh, inward investments that are coming down the track, which we'll be announcing in due course to continue to support that sector in Scotland. The vision for trade supports these aims by identifying actions the Scottish Government can take to influence that trading environment, building the necessary conditions for that, uh, that growth, and that offers opportunities for life science and biotechnology industries um, right, across, uh, right across Scotland. Claire Baker to be followed by John Mason. Um, thank you. Um, the statement today is a bit light on delivery plans, but the government are committing to a methodology to prioritise identified market access barriers. So can I ask what are the timescales for using this methodology? Um, will the minister share the uh, analysis with the parliament? I can ask who will be responsible for delivering the actions needed to address the barriers to market access? Minister. Uh, yeah, yeah, again, I'm pointing the member in the direction of a trading nation, which is the plan for growing Scotland's exports, which is obviously jam-packed full of, uh, of targets. And I'll be coming back to update the Parliament, as indicated earlier, uh, on those uh, at a detailed level very, very soon. Um, this, uh, the vision for trade is about how we trade. It's about our principles. It's how we interact with others around the world to be able to take forward those principles. It's about how we work with uh, others around the world on good governance, on tackling environmental challenges, uh, and, and making sure we're recognise that there are winners and losers from trade and how we position Scotland's uh, trading behaviour in that regard and about taking steps like identify to exit from our support for fossil fuels as part of our net zero, net zero missions. We are of course taking forward as identified in the, uh, in the vision for trade, uh, a process for identifying those, uh, those market access barriers, a process whereby businesses can notify those to us and then we can either uh, uh, deal with those uh, directly where we have the scope to do so on the world stage or where we have to engage through UK government, where they have the levers to do that, to work with them, to deliver on that. So we'll continue to do that, continue to identify those market barrier, access barriers, and continue to tackle them. Um, but as I said, if the member wants to know where we are on the export plan action, she should come back for 
the next instalment when she'll hear about an update on a trading nation. I appreciate that the, member, the Minister wishes to provide comprehensive responses, but I have several <coughs> members who would still like to, to put a question in this session. And I call John Mason to be followed by Willie Rennie. Hey, thank you very much. The Minister mentioned Australia and New Zealand agreements uh, in his statement and pointed out that there was no formal role for Scotland in that. Uh, does he agree with the comments from uh, the NFUS President Martin Kennedy that, quote, the, oh, sorry, the UK-New Zealand trade deal quote, offers virtually nothing to Scottish farmers and crofters in return, but risks undermining our valuable lamb, beef, dairy and horticultural sectors by granting access to large volumes of imported goods. Minister. Uh, yes, I do absolutely agree with that. And if the UK government had engaged us uh, in the full scale of the uh, process through those negotiations, as, uh, as many of their trading partners internationally do with their uh, sub-national um, jurisdictions, then we would be in a much better place. But the UK government has unfortunately refused to do that. And as part of our efforts through a vision for trade, we continue to call on them to, um, to behave in a much more uh, connected and inclusive manner and to include devolved administrations through, this, uh, through the process of negotiating these trade deals. Willie Rennie to be followed by Stuart McMillan. It's, it's depressing that the Minister comes back to the Chamber and reports on yet more disputes with the UK Government. Its inability to reach agreement with the UK Government is hampering our efforts in this area. So we need better from our two governments. This is important because since the SNP came to power 15 years ago, the trade deficit has grown significantly. So can I ask the Minister what the effect on the trade deficit will be of awarding two ferry contracts to Turkey and of constructing many of the offshore wind farms off the shore of Scotland to the Far East. What is the effect of the trade deficit of those two things? Minister. Uh, well, I should be aware that Scotland's um, trade uh, position is in a much better uh, position than that for the UK as a whole. And I, I think recent data has shown that Scotland has actually got a trade, uh, trade surplus compared to uh, the rest of, uh, of the UK. Um, it is something we want to continue to, uh, to build on. And as for disagreements, um, I, I really should listen more closely. Uh, we have been very keen to engage with uh, the UK Government. We have produced comprehensive documents for all of the FTAs have negotiated. We have made those available in plenty of time, articulating Scotland's position. Um, we have uh, positioned ourselves going right back to, uh, I think, four years now when we produced our, our paper articulating how Scotland and the devolved administration should be involved in this process. The UK Government has refused to engage with us on any of that. That is the root cause of the problem. We stand ready to engage with them, to uh, present Scotland's case, to uh, be part of those, uh, those trade negotiations. But the UK Government, uh, through their misguided policies, refuses to engage with us on that. And if he really wants to make a difference here, he should be pushing the UK Government to, uh, to take the devolved administration seriously in this regard. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, President Officer. I am sure that members across the Chamber will agree how important it is that work continues to ensure that Scotland operates as a good global citizen. And the Minister touched upon that in his statement when he spoke about the values. Can the Minister provide uh, an update as to the steps which have been taken to continue to develop and strengthen connections between human rights and also trade? Minister. Uh, the Vision for Trade very importantly recognises that human rights must be a central consideration in our trade policy. And as a part of that, we are looking to embed human rights considerations into our trade related activity, including through additional guidance on due diligence. We will continue to review this and benchmark ourselves against developments within the European Union. We will also seek to engage constructively with the UK Government, including on the negotiation of free trade agreements in this regard. The UK Government should ensure that future trading partners comply with fundamental human rights and international law. Maggie Chapman, to be followed by Douglas Lomsden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement. The annual report references fossil fuel subsidy reform, and the Minister referred to the free trade deals the UK Government has made with Australia and New Zealand. Can he provide further information on the impacts on our environmental and animal welfare standards that these deals will have, and how they, alongside the Internal Market Act, will limit our abilities to prevent environmental harm and maintain high regulatory standards in areas such as food safety, energy, animal welfare and climate? Minister. We take all of those issues extremely seriously, and uh, the vision for trade has that uh, at its core. We continue to engage, as I said, with uh, the UK Government to uh, make sure that uh, those principles are embedded in uh, any free trade agreements that they take forward, um, and we continue to highlight um, areas where that is, uh, that is not the case. The vision for trade recognised um, uh, internationally, frankly, as being um, a real benchmark on how to 
do trade in this, uh, in this manner um, has that uh, at, its, at its very core. Uh, and we are very proud of the fact that it allows us to articulate and make sure that those very important issues about how we trade as much as what we trade are absolutely central to Scotland's approach to international trade. Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Paul McLennan. Uh, President officer, after today, this devolved government is ending overseas trade support for oil and gas service companies. So does the minister agree with me that it will be now left up to local authorities in the North East to defend the thousands of jobs of workers in this sector? And will the minister take this opportunity to apologise to the people of the North East for this latest betrayal by the SNP Green Coalition of Chaos? Minister. Uh, I hate to break it to remember, but the UK government is also doing the, doing the same, um, and they are withdrawing, um, withdrawing support from uh, businesses that are fo solely uh, focused on, on fossil fuel um, exports. Um, it is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, it means it allows us to refocus that support. We are still spending the same amount of money on supporting those businesses. We are just focusing on businesses that are uh, transitioning into the renewable sectors, rather than businesses that are not transitioning into renewable sectors. And frankly, he should know this as well. The vast majority of businesses in the oil and gas sector, and I meet them on a very regular basis, um, are uh, well down the road of transitioning to, uh, to the oil and uh, to, to renewables um, and away from a sole reliance on the oil and gas sector. And frankly, for those businesses not to do that transition um, and for him to encourage them not to transition is, um, is absolutely um, counter to what he's trying to achieve and is harmful to, uh, to the economy of Scotland and to those that he represents. And Paul McLean. Thank you, President Officer. Edinburgh and South East uh, in the City Region deal recently approved a £30 million investment in the Food and Drink Innovation Hub at Queen Margaret University in East Lothian. East Lothian is, Food and Drink also has the only sector-based business improvement district in Scotland and is one of our major growth areas. With the continued effects of Brexit still impacting the sector, can I ask the Minister what the vision for trade can do to support growth in the food and drink sector in East Lothian and in Scotland? Minister. Uh, Scotland's food and drink sector is renowned around the world for its high quality standards uh, and provenance and our support um, for the Scotland Food and Drink Export Plan helps the industry exploit the most significant international opportunities and that sits alongside the food and drink sector recovery plan which mitigates against the impact of Brexit and COVID. The Vision for Trade supports this by identifying actions the Scottish Government can take to improve the trading environment benefiting the sector and we are keen that new free trade agreements offer opportunities for Scottish exports, um, although of course they will not uh, compensate for the barriers that the UK Government has erected between Scotland and uh, the EU. Thank you. That concludes the Ministerial Statement, Scotland's Vision for Trade Annual Report. We will move on to the next item of business. I will allow a moment for members to, to move places. <laughs>